This is the lecture for the second part of the symposium. So if you took my advice in the first lecture, I said, maybe try to read the whole symposium. Maybe you sort of jump to this lecture thinking, maybe I'll watch both lectures before I read it. And that's fine. This lecture will not assume that you've read the first half of the symposium. So you could just watch both lectures back to back. Maybe you've already read the first half and now you're on this one. That's fine too. So first we're going to start off with, uh, this, so Socrates shows up as a big character in this part of the symposium. And so I'm just going to point out three sort of Socratic things just so that we start to get to know Socrates because he's the main character of the other three dialogues that we're reading. And some of these, especially irony and questioning, will show up a bit uh, in the Apology lecture. I think, or the Euthyphro lecture or something. So this is sort of a preview of what's going to come. So for, and these are all when Socrates sort of first shows up right at the beginning of this reading. So uh, they're all giving speeches about love and it's Socrates' turn. And he says, uh, I realized how, rid how ridiculous I'd been to agree to join with you in praising love and to say that I was a master of the art of love when I knew nothing whatever of this business of how anything whatever ought to be praised. I was quite vain thinking I would talk well and that I knew the truth about praising anything whatever. And so he's saying, ooh, I, this was kind of silly of me to agree to give a speech. I don't know anything about love. I don't know anything about anything. So this is sort of classic Socratic ignorance. He sort of professes not to know anything about anything. Um, just interesting to see it pop up here. Uh, similarly, uh, I was quite vain, thinking I would talk well and that I knew the truth about praising anything whatever, but now it appears that this is not what it is to praise anything whatever. Rather, it is to apply to the object the grandest and most beautiful qualities, whether he actually has them or not. And if they're false, that's no objection, for the proposal, apparently, was that everyone here make the rest of us think he is praising love, not that he actually praise him. So. It's a little hard to tell if you haven't read the symposium up through here, but he's kind of referencing the speech that has just been given uh, by Agathon about love, where Agathon is sort of praising love and all its qualities. And he's basically making fun of Agathon. He's saying, oh, uh, I didn't realize that what we were supposed to do was praise all the good qualities that love has, even if it doesn't actually have these qualities. We're just basically lying our faces off. And so he's being ironic here. He's not, he doesn't think Agathon has gotten love correct, uh, but he's pretending to be like, oh, I didn't understand. We're doing the thing that Agathon was doing. Uh, I get it now, so I'll do that. But he's not going to do that. So this is Socrates being ironic. Um, another thing he's known for. Just interesting to see it pop up. And then after that, um, he basically starts going in this back and forth with Agathon, asking him a bunch of questions, and uh, by the end, Agathon kind of looks like a dope. And uh, this is another characteristic thing Socrates would do, walk up to people, ask them questions, and they end up looking like a dope. It's, um, as I say in one of the other lectures, it's kind of <laughs> mean. Notice uh, he gets uh, permission from Phaedrus before he does this, perhaps somewhat to alleviate the rudeness of what he's about to do to Agathon. So he asks Phaedrus permission to uh, do this to Agathon. I don't know if that's very fair to Agathon, but um, you can think about that when you read it. So those are just some interesting features of Socrates uh, as we get introduced to him in this dialogue, and then again, he's going to be very big in the other three we read. Moving on, uh, in this dialogue, we get two speeches. So we get Socrates' speech, and then we get, um, well, one and a half. We get Socrates, and then Alcibiades shows up, and Alcibiades gives a speech. And Alcibiades talks about uh, his relation with Socrates, and more broadly, his sort of romance and stuff. And so uh, this is a place to add some more context, which we didn't get in the first lecture, about what was, you know, what is going on with ancient Greek uh, male romance, uh, especially in Athens, especially among the aristocracy, like Alcibiades and Plato. And I guess Socrates wasn't the aristocracy, but he was 
mixing with these people. He, he, he was a good enough philosopher that the aristocracy wanted to hang out with him, so he would get invited to parties like this symposium. So um, the thing to keep in mind here is that what, like, so I said in the last lecture that you weren't really supposed to, like if you were the older man, you weren't really supposed to be having sex with the younger man. And you might think, well, what is left for there to do? Uh, what's the point of romance if there, it's going to be celibate? And so, again, this was in principle. And uh, in principle, what were these romances supposed to be for? Well, it was supposed to be a sort of like education mentorship thing for the younger person. So some things to keep in mind. The Greek family was not a very loving sort of family. Remember, the husband and wife were not really supposed to love each other. And uh, the husband especially would often not really be involved in uh, raising the kids in a very loving sort of way. And so uh, you might not have a great relationship with your father if you were a young man in ancient Greece. So who's going to sort of educate you and teach you about life and introduce you to society and stuff? Well, here comes your lover, the older man who's interested in pursuing you. He sort of takes on this mentorship role and he sort of, you know, teaches you how to be an aristocrat because, again, we're mostly thinking about aristocrats. He at least teaches you how to be like a citizen, even if this is not aristocrats, these are sort of the citizens of the state, the people, they're not slaves, um, so they have more rights than uh, many people, they're running things. So you sort of learn about these things, you learn about virtue, you learn how to be like a good person. Um, the There's a, an anecdote from Sparta, which had a similar thing going on uh, in terms of male romance, where uh, a young man like was flinching in pain or something during a fist fight and the Spartans were not supposed to do this. And so uh, his lover was punished. Like they were saying like, you're supposed to be teaching this young guy how to deal with pain and stuff. And clearly you're doing a bad job. So this was the thought you were supposed to sort of look after your younger male lover and sort of teach him things and make him into a good Greek. So that's some more context. Uh, that will help when you read Alcibiades and what he's talking about. Moving backwards in the dialogue, so to Socrates' speech. Socrates gives a speech, uh, but it's not a... It, I, is that this, in, think back to the first lecture where I was talking about the literary form of the dialogue, and it's kind of dialogue within dialogue. Socrates gives us a dialogue within a dialogue within a dialogue, I think maybe within a dialogue at this point, um, or maybe it's just three layers deep, I don't know. Um, but he relates a conversation he had with somebody else. And who is that somebody else? It's diatima. Diatima. Sorry, I always say that wrong. It's diatima. Who is diatima? Some interesting things. Well, one interesting thing. Uh, number one, she's a woman. So you probably got the impression from the previous lecture that this is a sort of deeply sexist society. And that's true. Uh, that doesn't, like, Plato doesn't, well, actually, actually, now that I think back, so the previous lecture, I said Plato's only interested in men. That was actually unfair. Uh, so we're not reading The Republic, but in The Republic, Plato actually proposes the ideal society, men and women would be sort of perfectly equal. They'd have equal jobs. Women would run the state just as much as men. Uh, women would be in the armies and stuff like that. So actually, that was really, that was really unfair to Plato. Plato, in fact, seems to think that women and men ought to be treated exactly the same in society, which is tremendously radical, not just for thousands of years ago, but like still today, people uh, disagree with this. So Plato, I was being very unfair to. Ancient Greek society, extremely sexist, however. So Plato big exception to the rule. Ancient Greek society, uh, nobody really cares what women have to say. And so it's interesting that Socrates not only cares what women have to say, he devotes his speech basically to reciting a speech somebody else gave, Diatima gave, and she is the authority here. She knows what is up with love, and Socrates is merely reporting what he has learned from her. So what should we make of this? There's not one obvious answer. This is like interesting stuff to think about, but like in the context of this whole 
everything like that's just something to point out like what is the relationship between socrates and diatima and socrates and the other characters in uh this dialogue it's interesting to think about um including the literary context of socrates relating a conversation he had with her in this conversation that socrates relates uh diatima talks about various things in which she ends up kind of praising what we call and what she calls obliquely the form of beauty and form with a capital f if you would like and what is going on there so plato this is uh diatima is basically giving plato's view of these things plato is famous for a number of things one of his famous doctrines is a metaphysical doctrine called the doctrine of the forms where plato thinks that uh reality as it appears to us is sort of a reflection of an imperfect reflection of uh what he calls the forms and the forms are sort of pure ideas or pure um concepts and so uh what we see in reality are sort of imperfect reflections of the purer concepts which exist uh purely in the mind or in the realm of the mind and so how exactly like which forms are there how many forms are there kind of a weird question at least in this style it's not, and it's not clear plato had one idea about this at least in this dialogue it seems like there is a form of beauty the sort of pure notion of beauty uh the idea of beauty sort of floating out there and then like beautiful things would be sort of imperfect reflections of the form of beauty and what diatima is talking about in this speech is the sort of the relationship between love and the form of beauty and so this is just to give you a little background on what plato has in mind and what maybe diatima has in mind when she's describing this kind of love and this will be pretty actually clear like you have to get to the end of her speech to get there but uh, you know it should make some sense and then finally just because we're talking about it uh there's this phrase platonic love which nowadays refers to uh you know love between friends or something like that it's it's non non-sexual non-romantic and also non-familial it's like its own category and it's plain uh i mean it, it comes from this dialogue but like I, you can go online just google platonic love origin or whatever and you can get the whole story it's kind of it goes on for like six steps or something but this is just to note number one you're reading the dialogue where this is from so interesting now you can learn where the idea of platonic love came from and number two this is it's sort of it changed so much over the thousands of years that what we use platonic love to describe is has almost nothing to do with what plato is describing but i mean there is some link like you can trace how the idea described specifically in diatima's speech like so just to be clear platonic love comes from the idea of love that diatima describes in as socrates describes diatima describing but as you know it's six layers deep again um but yeah so that's this is platonic love now you know where it comes from initially 